We're back with part two of the Humanoid Monsters ranking for 5e D&D. There are still lots to go through, so let's get in. Jumping into low B tier is the Bullywug Royal, which expands a bit on the baseline Bullywug. It's sort of a frog knight, wielding a lance or long spear weapon, riding atop a giant frog mount, and croaking battle cries that embolden its allies. It captures that Bullywug aspect of making their own warped versions of human-type society, and if you can get past the potential cartoonishness, it can serve a pretty neat role in an adventure or in a corner of your setting. I just wish the Bullywugs had a slightly more realistic and gritty style, or a cool origin story like the orcs and gnolls do. The Zavarts are a rather peculiar type of humanoid with some great lore. Long ago, a lowly creature named Raxavort served as a treasurer to the demon lord Grast. He ended up stealing a powerful artifact from Grast's hoard called the Infinity Spindle, which he used to become a demigod. Grass sent out all kinds of bounty hunters and bloodhounds to retrieve Raxavort and the spindle, but Raxavort hid within pandemonium, then devised a rather curious plan. He went to the material plane and spawned short, blue-skinned creatures that resembled himself. These are the Zavarts, and any divination attempt to locate Raxavort instead just finds the nearest Zavart. They're not able to reproduce, so it is solely Raxavort that brings them into existence. They are weak, disorganized, unmotivated, and lack morals, and they fear most other races. Their only allies are rats, bats, and perhaps other vermin, sometimes were-rats too. Abilities-wise, a Zvart is a sneaky, slippery thing with simple short sword and sling attacks. It can disengage as a bonus action, it's good at shoving creatures when it gangs up on them with allies, and it can communicate with bats and rats. These are decent if utilized well, but nothing amazing. It's really the great lore and general flexibility of the Zvarts that makes them work pretty well. Not a were-jackal, but a jackal were. The distinction is important, as these are not lycanthropes, but rather jackals turned into a monstrous-type humanoid by the demon lord Grast. A jackal were has three forms. A jackal, a human, or a hybrid of the two, which we see often in the artwork. It is usually a marauder-type creature, attacking with bites and scimitar strikes, and as well it uses a sleep gaze. The sleep effect is not too difficult to resist, it has a low DC of 10, and anyone who saves becomes immune to sleep gazes for 24 hours. But oddly, it does not specify that a sleeping creature taking damage will wake it up. Only if someone spends an action to shake it awake is it going to come out of the slumber. Anyhow, if the jackalware subdues their targets, they drag the victims away and bring them to Lamia masters, who either kill or enslave them. Next is the Kinku, a curious type of humanoid that is a mixture of tragedy and comedy, trickery, and the hope for redemption. The race was cursed long in the past by some powerful entity whom they betrayed, possibly the Raven Queen. The details are largely erased from history, and the Kinku as a whole share a dream to piece together this enigma. For their crimes, they lost their ability to fly as well as their ability to speak like people. They can only mimic voices and other sounds that they have heard, though their mimicry is incredibly competent. The Kenku now flock about the material plane, forming peculiar little communities of their own, and getting along as best they can as messengers, spies, thieves, criminals, and who knows what else. It's the Kenku's interesting background and racial plot hooks that really sell it, and they are also quite versatile as a creature. The Suwagin are one of the most recognized oceanic humanoids in D&D. They're connected to sharks and indeed worship a shark goddess, Sekola. They dwell in Suwagin cities within deep ocean trenches, but often venture out to hunt and raid. The Suwagin are generally lawful evil, making them organized, pitiless reavers who follow their own strict codes and take what they want from others. Their eternal enemies, no surprise here, are the Sea Elves. The Monster Manual also features the Sawagan Priestess and Baron, which are slightly better than the baseline one, though not enough to get it up out of B tier. We now come across another very classic monster, the Lizard Folk. As I've mentioned before, certain animal-human hybrid creatures work better than others. 
I don't want to bog down into this point, but let's just say there are reasons why a penguin folk or a hippo folk are goofy and tone clashing, but a lizard folk works really well. While lots of humanoid monsters are evil aligned, the lizard folk are neutral. Yes, they will fight and war and make living sacrifices to their great crocodile goddess Samoanya, but they usually do so for less sinister purposes and in general are merely trying to survive and carry on their traditions. Sometimes a lizard folk tribe comes under the rule of a dragon, and indeed they are inclined to revere dragons. They even speak draconic, not some lizard folk tongue of their own. So the dragon's goals and commands can have a big impact on lizard folk's behavior, for better or for worse. Their abilities are nothing too special, Essentially just basic attacks, a swim speed, and the ability to hold their breath for 15 minutes. They're a great race in many respects, but I cannot justify putting the baseline lizard folk any higher than low B tier. The Gith. Some of the best racial lore in D&D goes to this race, which is composed of two sub-races, the Gith Yanki and the Gith Zerai. I'm not a big fan of how they look, which always reminds me of bony, jaundiced elves with their noses hacked off, but that's my only real nitpick with the race. For a great span of time, the Gith were enslaved by the Mind Flayers. In captivity, they gained psionic powers and later fought back and won their freedom. They split into two separate factions afterwards, and this rivalry has turned quite bitter. The Gith Yanki are usually lawful evil, more cruel and harsh like reavers and warlords. They serve a lich queen, and they dwell within a massive city built from the corpse of a god floating in the astral sea. The Githzerai are usually lawful neutral, and they are more contemplative, seeking enlightenment and seclusion within their great stronghold in the plain of Limbo. There's so much to their lore, and if you take the time to read about it and delve into it, it's really worthwhile. The Githyanki warrior is a kind of psionic swordsman. It uses a silver greatsword that deals extra psychic damage, and it wields some innate psionic spells. Mage Hand, Jump, Non-Detection, and Misty Step. If only the Gith had a better appearance. But don't worry, you haven't seen the last of them in this ranking. Now we have the Goblinoids, another super well-known type of monster, a classic staple of D&D, one of the most core types of monsters in the game and just in all of fantasy. Between the Monster Manual and Volo's Guide, there is a ton of Goblinoid lore. Their gods are monstrous, mean, and warlike, and the Goblin kin themselves hit a sweet spot of being more monster-like than humans, but still more human-like than most monsters. Beginning the cycle of the three core goblinoids is the bugbear, the largest, strongest, and least intelligent one. It's a big, hairy goblinoid brute that has expertise in stealth and a sneak attack that it can use on the first round of combat if it surprises a creature. Bugbears love mayhem and marauding, and they are typically chaotic evil in alignment. Adventurers often encounter bugbears along with other goblinoids. Perhaps they are bullying around a bunch of little goblin minions, or maybe they're working for the more intelligent and organized hobgoblins. They worship Hragek, the bugbear god of ambushes, combat, and violence, who traditionally wields a morning star, which is thus the typical melee weapon for bugbears. Hragek's home is on the plain of Pandemonium, and is a cavern with multitudes of tunnels and chambers. The central cave features impaled severed heads of various races which eternally wail in praise of a savage god or beg him for mercy. Next is the Hobgoblin, the most advanced and civilized of the goblinoids, which typically has a lawful evil alignment. They are of human level intelligence with a penchant for smithing, construction, strategy, and organization. Whereas goblins are weak and skittish and bugbears are lurkers and brutes, the hobgoblins form militaristic legions bent on conquest. Imagine goblins are rats, bugbears are bears, and hobgoblins are wolves. In fact, they are known to breed and train wolves to aid them in battle and in hunting. The baseline hobgoblin warrior has an ability called martial advantage that allows them to deal extra damage whenever they gang up on a target. Their mechanics are simple, but they express the hobgoblin quite well. They have superior equipment and tactical training, but are still not very tough. 
Hobgoblins worship Maglubiet, the Mighty One, the chief of the goblin gods, and they believe that death in battle will grant them a place of honor in the afterlife. He appears as a giant-sized, black-skinned goblin with fiery eyes and a massive battle axe. His domain is war, and his home plane is the infinite battlefields of Asheron. Last is THE Goblin, one of the all-time most recognized creatures in all of fantasy. Fighting goblins as your first level adventure is like the most staple low-level trope of D&D, just behind fighting kobolds. In a way, goblins and kobolds are essentially the same monster, but D&D has distinguished them over time, particularly starting with 3E, the kobolds were taken in a more draconic direction. Goblins are typically neutral evil. They are agile skirmishers with expertise in stealth and extremely low hit points. They jitter about, shooting arrows from their short bows or slashing with scimitars if forced to fight up close. As a bonus action, they can disengage or hide, which perfectly captures how they are nimble, sneaky little buggers, yet cravens who are used to scampering away from direct combat and fair fights. They also worship Maglubiet, though are far from expressing his mightiness. Rather, goblins are the grunt swarms and fodder in battles where greater warriors get to claim the honor. Ah, goblin, the eternal underdog, the mischievous scamp that hides in the filthy nooks of the world. We could never go on without you. Moving into mid-beat here, we have the orc Red Fang of Shargoss. As I mentioned, it would be practically impossible to cover every single variant humanoid monster in one ranking. In the case of certain creatures, I thought it would be worthwhile to give an example of an advanced member of that monster race, one that I think is really among the best of what that kind of creature has to offer. Shargoss is an orc god of darkness and stealth, and he seems to have a particular liking for outcast orcs, showing his favor to those clandestine orc assassins. Shargoss hates all creatures other than orcs and bats. Those elite orc stealth warriors called Red Fangs serve Shargoss, riding giant bats on assassination missions and other covert operations. They have the cunning action of a rogue, the assassination, automatic critical hit against a surprise target like an assassin rogue, and once per short rest, they can cast darkness as an innate spell. They have the ability to see in magical darkness, so they have a built-in, very effective combo, and this couples with how they will likely be riding on giant bats that have blindsight and thus can see in the magical darkness. It does make for a potent orc assassin type creature and a stylish foe, to be sure. Nagpas are nasty, vulture-like humanoids that wield tremendous magical power. In fact, so mighty is their spellcasting that they are actually one of the most powerful kinds of humanoids in D&D. They sit at a lofty CR-17. They are not truly a race, but rather 13 great archmages that were cursed by the Raven Queen, the lawful neutral goddess of death. She cursed them for being conniving, plotting schemers whose tampering ruined a ritual that the Raven Queen was performing to avoid a war between the gods. What this potentially war-preventing ritual was exactly is not specified in the book. The goddess's curse restricted the Nagpas from ever learning any arcane knowledge or gaining any new magical abilities or items except from ruins or places that have been devastated by catastrophes. This is a bit odd, as it only fuels the Nagpas into being ever more the sowers of destruction and calamity. It's also odd that the lore says that the Raven Queen brought them so low, yet they are CR-17. The Archmage General NPC is CR-12. A 20th level player character is probably something between CR-12 to 14, maybe a little higher depending upon what magic items they have, but the Nagpa is CR 17 without any magic items. Which is also odd. Why would they have no magic items after all their long years of pursuing wizardry and combing through ruins? These issues and more hold the Nagpas back, which is a shame because they are an intriguing, Skeksy-like monster. 
The Shadar Kai are Shadowfell elves. Dreary and gloomy gothic elves who revel in extreme exploits and tragedy. They serve the Raven Queen, who is kind of present all over this ranking. They have a number of different elite ranks, such as Gloomweaver, Shadow Dancer, and Soul Monger. The Gloom Weaver imposes disadvantage on the saving throws of nearby enemies and has a number of fey packed warlock magics. The Shadow Dancer teleports between areas of dim light or darkness like a Shadow Monk and wields a spike chain weapon that it uses for a few different combat maneuvers. The Soul Monger is a kind of Gish that's a skirmisher or controller. It has dagger attacks that are powered by necrotic damage and impose disadvantage on the target's saving throws and its weary gloom slows down enemies, assaults their minds, and exhausts them. Shadar Kai have evolved a fair amount over the additions, but they've never strayed too far from their original spirit. They are interesting creatures, maybe not the greatest ever, but certainly worthwhile in many respects. The Durgar is another humanoid race with a long and storied history in D&D, with all kinds of lore, both of their own and in relation to the dwarves, who are their close cousins. By this point, it's something of a cliché to say this, but the Duergar were once dwarves, but after dwelling in the strange and sometimes magical Underdark as slaves of the Mind Flayers, they developed into their own race with their own powers. They are resistant to poison, like dwarves are. They're also resistant to spells, illusions, charms, and paralysis. They can enlarge themselves to a stronger, ogre-like size, and they can innately turn invisible once per short rest. They retain the orderly and structured lawful natures of dwarves, but have fallen from their original guiding morals into a corrupt, subterranean society. Just as they were once slaves to the Mind Flayers, they themselves now seek to dominate and enslave any who stand in their way. Of course, two wrongs don't make a right, simply more wrong. Thus, the Duergar function as an excellent option for villains in a campaign, bringing with them a wealth of stories, details, and plot hooks. The Kobold is another fantastic staple creature in D&D. They are small, scrawny, malicious, and pitiful, and at the same time, crafty, agile, and they're often allied to a dragon. A dragon overlord, to be exact. Kobolds are the weakest and lowliest of the dragonkin, though they pose quite a threat in large numbers, especially when you consider the abilities of their trapsmiths and sorcerers. They tend to live in underground tunnels and complexes that they build, and are overall quite an industrious race, a great monster for low levels and even well into the mid-levels of the game. Moving into high B tier, we find the lizard folk Shaman. It takes the solid baseline of the lizard folk and gives it some druidic magic like Entangle, Fog Cloud, Heat Metal, Spike Growth, and Conjure Animals, reptiles only. As well, it has the ability to shape change into a crocodile. It's thematic, dynamic in an encounter, and it serves a great leader slash wise man role in lizard folk society. The Kuo Toa are underdark fish people who, you guessed it, were once enslaved by the Mind Flayers and experimented upon and warped into what they are now. Yeah, D&D really uses that trope a lot. The Mind Flayers' magical tampering drove the Quotoa insane, and from their shattered minds, they ended up spawning their own mad gods, born of nightmarish imaginations and collective magical power. Are these true gods in the celestial sense? No, no, but powerful enough to serve as deities. The Quotoa have some cool combat abilities, from slippery bodies and sticky shields, to amphibious movement and otherworldly perception, and the always interesting net weapon. Their appearance can be hit or miss, as we've seen with certain kinds of beast folk creatures. For me, they work better than, say, the Lokatha or the Tortle, but not as good as some others. Though their strange eldritch tone does enhance the aesthetics. The Flind is just one of the best gnolls out there. It's favored by their demon lord, Yinogu. The Flind is like a gnoll general or a war band leader. It's much, much more powerful than a typical gnoll and as vicious as they come. It has a bloodthirst aura that lets all gnolls around it make extra bite attacks as a bonus action. 
It wields a scourge flail of skulls that it uses for three different attacks. Madness, pain, and paralysis. If needed, it also has a longbow for ranged attacks, though it is nowhere near as strong as it is in melee. At the top of B tier, we have the Lycanthropes. Mechanically, they are of medium complexity, essentially having their three forms, animal, humanoid, and hybrid. Each form has its own advantages, and overall, 5e went to great efforts to make the Lycanthropes easier and simpler to run than before. They used to be far more complicated, especially in 3e. Drawing from classic lore, they are immune to weapons that are not silvered, but in D&D they can be harmed with magical weapons and spells. There are actually various lycanthropes. Essentially any predator animal or semi-predator animal can serve as a base type, bringing with it its own maneuvers, its own look, and even its own alignment. And of course, as we would expect, a lycanthrope's bite can inflict the target with a curse that turns it into the same type of lycanthrope. Werewolf is by far the most classic lycanthrope, but others such as werebear, were-rat, and were-tiger exist too. B-tier has a lot of creatures in it, and they're each worth reading about and using in your own campaigns. Some of them do have some substantial limitations though, but you can always improve upon that by adding in enhanced styles, or an additional combat ability, or maybe a kind of new intriguing personality or a story hook. Now, let's set our sights on A-tier. The Nilbog is quite a unique monster. Long ago, Maglubiet and all the other rising goblinoid deities rivaled one another for the top position. During this struggle, Maglubiet slew a trickster deity whose name has been either lost or erased from history. As a god cannot truly 100% die die, the essence of this trickster scattered into a weakened state through the cosmos. In the present day, this spirit can possess a goblin, turning it into an exaggerated prankster known as a nilbog, goblin spelled backwards, as it causes others to do the opposite of what they want to do. A nilbog wreaks havoc throughout a goblin community and is extremely difficult to defeat as it can turn damage against itself into healing, and if someone does manage to slay it, the spirit will then go on to just possess a different goblin host. The best remedy is to actually appease the Nilbog and let it play out its riotous antics. Due to paranoia over Nilbogism, most goblin bands have an appointed jester. This joke-playing rapscallion is allowed to say and do whatever it wants, and is generally treated with good humor. Goblins believe that by allowing these jesters, they will make the unnamed dead trickster god happy and he will not visit them with Nilbog possession. This is some of the best goblinoid lore, even some of the best D&D lore in general in my opinion. It's the sort of monster that I just can't wait to feature in a campaign. And as you probably know, I really get into character, hamming up these kinds of eccentric creatures, and especially something as sadistic and darkly humored as a goblin is just a blast to run. Next we have the Duergar Warlord. There are actually various kinds of Duergar, each one fulfilling some kind of role or specialization in the Duergar's plot to conquer foes and ultimately wreak their revenge upon the pantheon of dwarven gods, who they claim abandoned them and rendered no aid when they were enslaved by the Mind Flayers. The Warlord builds upon the baseline Duergar, adding to it a battle cry that lets other Duergar use their reactions to make attacks and a scouring instruction in which the Warlord bolsters allies' d20 rolls by sacrificing a bit of his own hit points. The Warlord can also enlarge and make attacks in the same turn, instead of having to dedicate a whole turn just to the enlarging. I also want to mention the Duergar Despot here because it's just as cool. It's the highest CR Duergar in 5e, representing a kind of psionic warrior that has replaced parts of its body with mechanical or golem-like parts. Aside from its psionic spells, the despot has a flame jet, stomping metal feet, and iron fists that pummel enemies and send them flying back, only to crash and take more damage. The Arakokra is a fantastic humanoid creature, a bird folk or eagle folk with connections to the elemental plane of air. They also have the claim to being alphabetically first among all the D&D monsters. 
The base Arakokra flies about hurling javelins and dive-bombing targets with claw swipes. Five Arakokra together can form an aerial dance over three rounds that summons an air elemental, a rather strong ally compared to the Arakokra's own CR, a mere one quarter. The Arakokra also shines in the areas of role-playing, lore, and versatility. I suppose they could use a bit more lore, but what we do have is fertile, and it's unique enough to serve as the foundation for entire adventure locations, or even a whole region of a setting. The Quotoa Archpriest serves Blibdulpulp, or one of the other bizarre Quotoa gods. It is basically a 10th level Quotoa cleric with a lightning-infused melee scepter. Its typical spells include things like Scrying, Mass Cure Wounds, Spirit Guardians, Hold Person, and Sanctuary. It takes what's great about the weird Quotoa race, leans into their strange religious practices, and gives us a bunch of spells that make an encounter far more dynamic. Much more serious in tone, but possibly even more intriguing is the Hobgoblin Iron Shadow, which leads us into mid-A tier. It's something like a multi-class of two levels of wizard and three levels of shadow monk. This clandestine order of shadow monks serves as spies, scouts, and assassins, and they operate both within the hobgoblin's own clan and externally. Within their own home ground, the Iron Shadows keep a sharp lookout for any signs of treachery or rebellion in the ranks. As such, they're a type of secret police amongst the hobgoblins. When making direct attacks, they don devil masks that not only serve to instill fear in their foes, but also represent how Maglubiet once bested an archdevil and stole the powers of shadow magic to bestow upon these favored agents. My only real nitpick with the Iron Shadow Hobgoblin is that I think its CR should be a bit higher. I don't think that CR2 quite captures it. If you read the lore, acceptance into the Order of the Iron Shadows is no easy task. The entrance trial is a matter of life and death, as those who fail are slain, that is, if they don't perish from the trial itself. Those who are accepted then go through years of rigorous training and study in order to become one of these rare and elite types of hobgoblins. Similar to the sea spawn in some respects is the Deep Scion. Originally a human or other common race, a Deep Scion was transformed by a fell and powerful monster of the depths. Perhaps a Kraken, perhaps, who knows, maybe Dagon. Deep Scions can shape change between their regular humanoid form and their nightmarish hybrid form that we see here, which is something straight from the pages of a Lovecraft story. Aside from natural attacks, the Deep Scion has a psychic screech that stuns creatures within 30 feet of it, and if it's in the water, the screech transmits the Scion's last 24 hours of memories to its grim master, across any distance, just as long as the master is also in the same body of water. In high A tier, we have the Kobold Inventor, which is probably my favorite of all the Kobolds. This monster is just a toolbox of unique, flavorful, and fun options. Just listen to these things it has at its disposal. Acid, alchemist fire, basket of centipedes, pot of green slime, pot of rot grubs, scorpion on a stick, skunk in a cage, and wasp nest in a bag. Monsters don't get much more fun than this. The Kobold Inventor embodies those interesting bits of lore we've read about in the monster manuals over the years, about how kobolds use murder holes and defensive terrain while they sling alchemical goop and poisonous vermin at their adversaries. I just love it when the lore and the writing also exists as interesting abilities in the stat block. You know that a monster is really well designed when, right after you read its entry, your mind immediately fills with ideas and motivation for an encounter with it. It's nice to have the simple baseline kobold. Those are the average Joes, and the DM needs to have uncomplicated moot creatures to fill out the enemy ranks. But the kobold inventor expresses the true soul of kobold kind, a rascally ruffian with an arsenal of bizarre tools. At the top of A tier is the drow. It is hard to think of another humanoid monster in D&D that is this stylistically evocative, this rich in lore and storytelling. The drow strike a balance between dark, seductive beauty 
and wicked complex plots. It's so ripe for conflict and adventure. Lately, there has been a push to make the drow and other evil creatures broader, such that they don't all have to always be evil, killers, rapists, xenophobes, slavers, demon worshippers, tyrants, uh, well, you get the idea. We'll see how this new approach pans out. I'm not sure that this is being implemented in the best way. And I do worry that in its attempt to improve the game, it might inadvertently weaken the game. After all, conflict drives stories and plots. But again, we'll see, it's probably too early to know for sure. Anyhow, the drow, as they've classically been known, have obsidian black skin, pale white hair, and pale nearly white eyes that can see far in lightless caverns. They have a bitter rivalry between others of elven kind, and surface dwellers in general. Their main deity is Lolth, a demon queen of spiders who is as vile and treacherous as they come. Lolth is fickle, though immensely powerful. Drow society is matriarchal, and women are seen as superior to men. All religious leaders are priestesses, as men are not allowed to hold such a position. That said, there are many powerful male drow that are wizards or warriors, but they will always serve the will of their house matron, and in theory, the will of Lolth. The baseline drow wields a short sword and a hand crossbow that has poison that could potentially knock a creature unconscious. They have a few innate spells, dancing lights, darkness, and fairy fire, and they are sensitive to sunlight like many underground creatures are. There are a number of other drow variants and higher ranks, and we'll touch on another one very soon. Overall, they're such a fascinating creature in D&D, one that I have been interested in since I first read the great 3E book, Drow of the Underdark. But that concludes A tier. They are all excellent options for campaigns, but there are a few that rank higher still, which brings us to S tier, the cream of the crop, the best of the best, the monsters that are nearly perfect in how inspiring, interesting, and wonderfully challenging they are. In low S tier is the Yuan Ti Pure Blood. Most Yuan Ti are monstrosities, but the Pure Blood is actually a humanoid, and it is the closest to the Yuan Ti's original roots as humans. There's a wealth of Yuan Ti lore in D&D, but the basic concept is that in ages past, they were humans of a great and powerful empire. A serpent-worshipping religion rose to prominence, which led to magic rituals that transformed the Yuan Ti into human-snake hybrids. Their empire eventually fell, but there are still remote areas in which Yuan Ti communities thrive, erecting settlements around their mystifying temples and shadowy cabals. They view emotions as nothing more than a weakness to be exploited, and their serpent gods are but a means by which to attain power. The Yon Ti are perfect villains in many contexts, from evil spellcasters and cultists, to assassins and blackblades, to fanatical warriors and battle mages, and on and on. Their plots and aspirations are many, though always with an evil design, or at least an impure or selfish design. The Yon Ti purebloods sometimes infiltrate cities and other places where they can disguise themselves as humans. Their snake-like eyes Forked tongues and patches of scales give them away, but they take measures to avoid these features being noticed. Mechanics-wise, a pure blood shoots poison-infused arrows, has magic resistance, and wields a few interesting innate spells. Animal friendship, snakes only, poison spray, and suggestion. There are some really great gith entries in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, one such being the Githyanki Supreme Commander. It is exactly what the name would lead us to imagine, the leader of a Githyanki army. He rides into battle atop a red dragon and wields some incredible abilities. Innate psionic spells like Big B's Hand, Telekinesis, Mass Suggestion, and Plane Shift. Along with this, he has legendary actions to make extra attacks, teleport at a short range, or command an ally to make an attack as a reaction. He also wields a silver greatsword that deals an extra 5d6 psychic damage per hit, and on a critical hit, it has the unique ability of being able to sever the silvery cord of a creature who is astral projecting, 
which kills it instantly. We also have the Githzerai Anarch, which is a mystical leader in one of the Githzerai adamantine citadels that exist throughout the plains. It's a sort of legendary monk with immensely powerful unarmed strikes, innate psionic spells like telekinesis, shield, globe of invulnerability, plane shift, wall of force, and others. With legendary actions, it can make even more unarmed strikes, teleport up to 30 feet, or cast reverse gravity. It also has layer actions. It can cast a 5th level lightning bolt spell that can be any type of elemental damage. It can cast a creation spell. And it can move objects with its mind. Furthermore, if the layer is on the plane of limbo, the Anarch can stabilize the chaotic matter and potential around it for miles, creating pockets of order and habitable environments. However, if the Anarch perishes, those in this region have only a matter of a mere 1d6 rounds before all unravels back into the churning chaos. This has some dire implications for all those who are currently there. In mid S tier, we come to the final creature in the humanoid's ranking, and what a fitting creature she is, the Drow Matron Mother. Such a Drow is a Grand High Priestess of Loth and the head of a major Drow noble house. This loftiest of the Dark Elves is a staggering confluence of awesome magical powers, dark and sinister beauty, and vile, treacherous evil. This is the type of villain that works as the final boss of an entire campaign, and there's no limits to how far her webs of insidious influence reach. Her stat block alone engulfs nearly an entire page, it's filled with all kinds of spells. Essentially, she has a slew of drow innate spells, plus the spells of a 20th level cleric. She can bestow Loth's fickle favor, which harms the recipient, even as it grants their next attack advantage. She wields two weapons, a demon staff that deals psychic damage and inflicts fear, and a tentacle rod that can inflict a slow-like effect, though I do think his attack modifier and effect DC are too low. She can summon a Yaklul demon or a retriever, both are incredibly strong allies. Her legendary actions are additional spell casting, a demon staff attack, and a command that gives a demon ally an attack with its reaction. I wish that she had layer actions as well. It's possible the designers just had space limitations here and so they opted going for an additional drow creature entry instead of her layer actions. Also. I know that the creators of D&D are trying to broaden the drow race currently, such that they're not all evil, but there's no denying how epic and inspiring this wicked matron mother is. Along with all her house members, and rival houses, and the plots, and the underdark conquests, it's just so hard to top that in terms of how ripe it is. It's just begging for adventure, and all its dire conflicts, and ordeals that push mortal heroes to the extreme limits. I may have no love for the drow matron mother herself, but I love the villainous power, the fuel that it puts into the fire of that grand struggle to reach ever higher character levels in order to finally fight for ultimate victory against this villainess, or perhaps end an ultimate tragic defeat. This is the stuff of legends, my friends. Here we have the humanoids of 5e D&D. Again, there was no way to fit every single one of them into this hefty and ambitious ranking, but I'm glad I was able to get so many. They are overall an incredible bunch of monsters, composing large swaths of the fabric of D&D. There are many of them that I personally like very much, and I have used time and time again in my campaigns, and my desire to feature them seems to never run out. A number of memorable adventures from my campaigns, even in recent years, have included various different humanoids. There were the three warring goblin tribes in Moss Folly Caverns, a swampy cave which used to be a dragon's lair, where the turtle riding Kirshades clashed against the frog riding Bog Spikes and the bat riding Rumstalegs. There were the two rival lizard folk tribes of the Dins Morris and Drekengrim. The green scales who sought symbiosis with the swamp dwarves, and the Hydra tribe who allied with trolls, dwarven renegades, and the necromancer Swamp Queen. There was the Grimlock Bat Shaman of an Underdark Grimm's survival campaign 
who ended up exchanging valuable information with the party, which then went on to battle one Grimlock clan and interact peaceably with another. The same campaign featured darkly mystifying drow elements, and eventually led to an unforgettable assault sequence at a drow city which lay at the edge of the bay to an underground sea. One of my few campaigns to end in a TPK, by the way. There have been hobgoblin cities and pirates, goblin cults of Maglubiet, kobold trap gauntlets, yon tea temples with terrifying rituals, swagan raiders, and knoll uprisings that sacked the borderland villages, kinku assassins who the characters could never pin down, Durgar clans in league with the archdevil Garion and marching to dominate the world, Shadar Kai cultists of the Raven Queen at the harrowing Shadow Temple, orcish armies that swept across the realm, provoking endless debates amongst the civilized folk as to how they should handle the spreading crisis. These and many more, my brave companions. These and many, many more. These are our memories. These are our myths and legends. These are the epic poems and the heroic stories of which we are all a part. I don't know exactly what the future of Dungeons & Dragons is going to bring, but I do know that I will continue to uphold my vow to keep the torch of inspiration and courage held aloft so that we may forge our way through the unknown. Once again, I invite you to experience more than just these videos. If you're eager to find more wondrous creatures and game options, I'm leaving links down in the video description to my Patreon, which has monthly content, monsters, maps, and much, much more, as well as a link to my website where you can acquire my 5e book, which is bursting full of content for players, GMs, and those who are simply monster lovers. Thank you very much for watching as always, and may your adventures be many.